Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome once again to Stately Vaughn Manor, where today I'm going to be talking about The Forgotten Planet. The Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. Yes, The Forgotten Planet, which is this month's pick in Roger's Cheap Old Book Club. My pal Roger here has a book club, and every month we have a new book, which is really cheap because they are all available in the public domain. Every pick of Roger's Cheap Old Book Club can be downloaded for free from Project Gutenberg, for example, and some other places, maybe. So, you know, if you want to read any of these books, you can for nothing. But this copy is the old Ace paperback edition of The Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster, and it's a lot of fun, as you can tell that it would be from this fantastic cover where our hero Burl faces off against a gigantic wasp. There are a lot of giant bugs in this book, which is one of the reasons why it's just so darn fun. And it is a fun book, not quite of the quality of last month's pick, which was The Prisoner of Zenda, but at the same time, it was a lot of fun. And I had read the first part of this before, because this is what's known as a fix-up novel, which used to be pretty common, actually, back in the days when genre fiction was mostly originally published in magazines, pulp magazines and digest size magazines from the 20s through the 50s. A lot of, like I said, a lot of genre fiction was originally published in magazines. And sometimes when a writer wanted to put together a book, they would just go back to other material that had been previously published in magazines. And if they shared a common theme or characters or even a plot, they would fix them up into a novel. And we have some really famous examples of that, some really successful, exam successful examples of that, like The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury and City by Clifford D. Simak. Two great, great fix-up novels, which are highly acclaimed. This one is not quite as successful as those books, but still, like I said, a lot of fun. So let's talk a bit about it. And let's talk about Murray Leinster, because Murray Leinster has kind of been forgotten, which is why this book from the 50s, this was published in book form in 1954, that's why this book is even available for free, you know, because his work, for the most part, has lapsed into the public domain. So, Murray Leinster, that was a pen name for a guy named William Fitzgerald Jenkins. He wrote a ton of stuff under different pseudonyms. He was born June 16th, 1896, and he passed away June 8th through 1975. And indeed, if you were a science fiction fan up through the 1970s, you knew the name Murray Leinster. Uh, you knew who this writer was just because he wrote so much. He wrote, I think it was 1,500 short stories. He also wrote for the radio. He wrote screenplays. He wrote a bunch of different stuff, but of course he's best known for his fiction, his science fiction. He wrote other things besides science fiction, but it's the science fiction that he's best known for. If he's remembered at all nowadays, that's what he's remembered for, is his science fiction. And like I said, he wrote a lot of it. And so none of it is being reprinted now from any major publishers, I don't believe. You can find it reprinted in kind of print-on-demand outfits will reprint it, or there are some smaller publishers who are reprinting his stuff, including The Forgotten Planet. But otherwise, uh, he's kind of forgotten. You can find his stuff on uh, as ebooks because, you know, it's in the public domain, so you can find it as ebooks. Pretty easily, all of his stuff, or at least a lot of his stuff. Including The Forgotten Planet. So The Forgotten Planet was originally three different stories. Well, he wrote two stories. He wrote The Mad Planet in 1920 
and he followed that up with a story called Red Dust, which was the sequel to The Mad Planet, which came out in 1921. And then those stories just kind of sat around for years and years and years. He didn't bother to write a sequel to either of those. I guess he didn't really feel like they needed a sequel until the 1950s when he thought about putting those stories together and publishing them as a book. But those stories were not quite long enough even to make a book of this length, so he had to write a third part, which he titled Nightmare Planet, which was published in 1953. So there was a long span of time between Red Dust and Nightmare Planet. And so the conclusion of this was, was written way later, specifically because he wanted to put together a fix-up novel of these stories. And you can tell. When you get to the third part, you can tell. I think the first two parts of the story of the novel actually fit together pretty well. When you get to the third part, there's a change in style, certainly. And there were some other interesting things. He had to change some stuff because originally The Forgotten Planet was a, was a story about the far future of the planet Earth when the environment had changed. And because of environmental differences and catastrophes, insect life and bugs and stuff and some other things had all grown to gigantic size and taken over the planet. Human beings have been pretty much wiped out except for small communities which basically lived in terror and ran away from the giant bugs and struggled to survive and were slowly dying out completely. That is the world of the Mad Planet and Red Dust. By the time of the third part, Murray Leinster had, rethought, has, had rethought this. And in the third part, he changes things up so that it is not, in fact, the future planet Earth. It is, in fact, another world entirely. It is another planet, a planet that has been forgotten. You see, in the far future of this novel, as it was fixed up, colonization has spread across the universe, or at least the galaxy, and there was a planet, and it was completely uninhabitable. It was unfit for human beings to live on. So they started to, human beings started to change the planet. They introduced different life forms. They kind of started to terraform it. Murray Leinster did have some ideas that were way ahead of his time, and this was kind of one of them, where you would change the environment of a planet so that it would eventually become habitable for human beings. Murray Leinster had some really good ideas. He's the first person to come up with the idea of a universal translator, which was used extensively in Star Trek. He came up, he might have been one of the first people who predicted the internet because he predicted computers, which he called logics, that were connected together and could share information. Uh, that was in a story, I believe, called A Logic Called Joe, or Logic Named Joe. It's been a while since I've read that story. But he came up with some great ideas. And so he had one of those ideas in this book. The problem was, you know, and it's interesting, these stories, the first two stories, were written in the 1920s. So he was able to think far ahead about the future. And by the 1950s, he was able to think ahead to the idea of not only colonizing the galaxy, which is, you know, a pretty old science fiction idea, but changing the environment of a planet. But he wasn't able to come up with, with, real, with a realistic idea about how this would be done because, you know, he just, you know, he was in the 50s. And so the reason this planet was forgotten was because, you know, the information for this planet was all on a punch card and the card got lost. Oops, someone just lost the card. And so this planet was forgotten because of a very, you know, old-timey kind of error in filing. And so this planet had already been seeded with insect life and spiders and stuff like that. But then was forgotten for, you know, who 
who knows how long. I forget how long it was forgotten, but it was long enough for the insects, for whatever reason, to become giant. The insects on this planet became giant. I don't know what the environmental reasons for this were, but yeah, the spiders and insects, they all got huge on this planet, and they ruled this planet. Because there was nothing on this planet except giant mushrooms and stuff like that. But then, a ship full of human beings crash-landed on this planet. Human beings and dogs. There were dogs on this ship too, apparently. We find out later in the novel. There were dogs. Now, this is not the story of that initial catastrophe. We learn that the survivors of this shipwreck survived barely, and they were able to, you know, they had kids. They, they basically, they didn't call, it was kind of like an accidental colonization. They crash landed on this forgotten planet. No other human beings knew where they were or what had happened because the planet was forgotten. And so human beings lived on in this environment, but they kind of degenerated into savages because, you know, they spent all their time trying not to get killed by these giant insects. But eventually, our hero of the story, Burl, through a set of circumstances and his own unique machismo and heroism, becomes this world's first mighty hero, and he finds a way to fight back against the giant spiders and insects. And he learns to, like I said, he learns to fight back, to stand up against all of the monsters in this terrifying environment. And he helps lead his people to a new life. A lot of this book is spent fighting giant bugs which I'm all for. A lot of this book is just basic survival. Burl surviving, battling spiders, battling wasps, battling giant poisonous mushrooms. And he basically does this through the entire novel. Through all three stories that make up this book, he's fighting off these menaces. And because he has learned to fight, he is able to save humanity, basically. That's the idea, that he is going to save humanity because of this. Humanity on this planet, which has been forgotten. Now, the first two parts of this work together fairly well. The first part of this, the Mad Planet, is actually quite good and is an excellent standalone story all on its own. It works better as a standalone story, probably, than it does as a novel, even though the novel is fun. The first two stories work well, but when Murray Leinster, Murray Leinster got around to writing the third part, he never really bothered to try to match the style of the original stories. And so there is a difference in style. Dialogue suddenly, suddenly starts appearing. There is no dialogue for the, for the earlier parts of this novel. And then suddenly at the, the end, there, there's, you know, it just, people start talking to each other. <laughs> As they did the whole time, I'm sure, but we never really had any dialogue that was presented. And so that was a difference. And the ending where Burl leads his people to safety seems very contrived. The very ending of the story, however, when something quite unexpected happens, well, it's not unexpected, but the way it sort of shapes out, I wasn't expecting, but makes perfect sense. So it's kind of a mixed bag, this book. It is very, very, very pulpy. It's just a pulpy story, basically. Made up of two very pulpy stories from the 1920s and one from the 1950s that was made just to make the book. And so it's not of the highest quality. This is not, you know, classic science fiction of the level that most of the classic science fiction we think of. Like, it's not... Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke or something like that. This is pulpier stuff. And Murray Leinster, Murray Leinster was always kind of like that. 
He wrote a lot of stories that seemed very, very pulpy. Very entertaining though, very entertaining writer. And I had a good time with this book. So it's fun. It's definite, it's definitely fun. If you like, you know, human beings battling against giant monsters. I kept picturing the whole thing as a really cheesy 1950s movie in my head with like really cheap scenes of Burl fighting off spiders and wasps and bugs. It would have made a great 1950s giant monster movie. Man, I wish they had made this as a giant monster movie in the 50s. That would have been fantastic. As it is, it was an awful fun book. So The Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. You should check it out. You can check it out for free. It was an interesting choice, Roger. But next month's choice is of higher quality. It's the famous author Robert Louis Stevenson and his book, The New Arabian Nights, a collection of short stories that not many people read anymore, but available for free and a high quality piece of work from what I remember of these stories. So this is next month's New Arabian Nights. If you want to join along with us, that would be fantastic. We talk about these books on my Discord, which I'll link down below. And I guess that's all I have to say about The Forgotten Planet. I will catch you next time.